I'm Teresa Caraggio, and this is Third Paradigm. This week, Russell Brand, on his Under the Skin podcast, interviewed David Buss. David is a founder of the field of evolutionary psychology and wrote the textbook on it. David's focus is on mating strategies. So he looks at things like mate selection, infidelity, mate poaching, and emotions associated with mating like lust and jealousy. Some of his books include The Evolution of Desire and Why Women Have Sex, When Men Behave Badly, and Jealousy, The Dangerous Passion, Is It As Necessary As Love and Lust? One of the influences for David was Steven Pinker, the author of The Better Angels of Our Nature, Why Violence Has Declined. So both Buss and Pinker are the ultimate Hobbesians, who believe that for our ancestors, life was nasty, brutish, and short. And over the last 5,000 years, as nations and cities and states grew and were given a monopoly on the legitimate use of violence, violence overall has declined. They also look at how medicine and food have lengthened our lives and have made populations boom, while at the same time, according to Buss, our reproductive uh, urges are still geared towards a situation in which the monkey brain is saying we need to reproduce. I happen to be reading a book that starts out by debunking Pinker which is The Dawn of Everything, A New History of Humanity. And this is by David Graeber and David Wengro. David Graeber is an anthropologist and David Wengro is an archaeologist. Now, David Graeber is the major influence on my book, How to Dismantle an Empire. He changed everything that I thought I knew about money. In this book, it's a decade-long conversation between the two and David Graeber died three weeks after they finished this book. One of my viewers, Jack Sirius, has said that he's reading both of these books together, which is what reminded me that I had this on my shelf, and that they made great companion pieces. He said it was like two connect the dots that were overlaid, and the least mystical thing he could say about it was that we seem to be cut from the same cloth. I think that is one of the nicest things anyone's ever said about me. As Wengro says of Graeber in the foreword, he's much more than an anthropologist. David Graeber is one of the most original thinkers that I've ever encountered. He wrote the book, Debt the First 5,000 Years, and that's what set my course for the next decade. He's also written Bullshit Jobs and The Utopia of Rules, And those are both really defining ideas that changed the way that I thought. So let's revive him for one convivial debate of the Daves. As always, we have to start by defining the question. Is the current state of relationships between the sexes the result of evolutionary nature or the nurture of money and its power dynamics. So is it evolution or social distortion? Is it the better angel of our nature or is it the devil in the details? Let's start by looking at what is the current state of binary gendered sexual relationships. That state is dismal according to Buss. Birth rates are down, marriages are down, and even actual sex between real people isn't happening so much. But pornography is off the charts. Of all the various uses of the internet, it's the single one that the internet is most used for. And most men engage in it, according to Buss, although he doesn't see a problem with that. And that's a worldwide phenomenon, according to a book that I've referenced before called Facebooking the Anthropocene in Raja Ampat, an excellent book. Testosterone and sperm count have also shrunk along with penis size, but erectile dysfunction Viagra to the rescue as long as you value form over function, sex as recreation rather than procreation. 
Bus ascribes the mating behavior of men as driven by an evolutionary urge to propagate their seed as widely and fruitfully as possible. And so that's why men who have prestige, resources, and social status, that which makes life worthwhile, according to him, tend to be attracted to and mate with young, fertile women. As an example, he gives Leonardo DiCaprio, who, as he's aged, his girlfriends and wives have stayed in their early 20s. Now, this isn't to him just because the penis brain is stuck in adolescent, or my favorite theory, which is that men don't have mirrors and so they still see themselves as if they're in their 20s. But he says it's because men just want to have babies, 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 looking back at them with their very own simian eyes. Now, surely the relationship between sex and reproduction is more evolved in women. According to Buss, only because they have a higher investment, because they have to carry the baby for nine months and then nurse it, after which presumably it's on its own. So for women, they're driven to find quality over quantity, and that's why they're attracted to things like resources and social status that give their offspring a better chance of survival. So what about women who have their own resources and social prestige? Are they also driven to mate with multiple 20-somethings? According to Buss, no. He uses the example of actresses and says that they use that prestige in order to improve the genetic mashup of their offspring. And no other examples of successful women seem to come to mind for him. So when men want sex with college co-eds, it's because my monkey brain made me do it. But even when women have sex, it's not because they want sex, according to his book by that same title. It's because they want to keep the breadwinner bringing home the bread, or to get him to do the dishes, or to cure a migraine. So While men would gladly bonk a half dozen women as they walk down the street if our civilization didn't keep them in check, for women, they're manipulative. And even when they have sex, it's not because they want sex. So while men have sex because they're driven to reproduce, obvi, women have sex in order to get something other than sex. That's where conflict, competition, and manipulation come in. So boys just want to have fun and make babies, whereas women are genetic grifters who are after grabbing the resources. Now, when Buss uses the term resources, it makes it sound like it's an oil rig or a bean field when really it's a euphemism for money. Women are not lining up to mate with the janitor, no matter how resourceful he is or how his 23 in me shapes up. Buss also sees online dating as a genetic bonanza where the sperm and ova of halfway around the world can have their own meet and greet. But when he describes that hookup from Bangkok and Sao Paulo, is he really thinking that No money is being exchanged between the paunchy stockbroker and the young woman. The question isn't really that we need evolutionary psychology to explain why men want to have sex with 20-somethings. The question that we really need to answer is why those 20-somethings are having sex with them. That's the question we need an anthropologist for. In the evolution of desire, Buss gives examples from 37 different cultures, one of which is the Yanumami of Venezuela, which is also Pinker's primary example of the savage people. Now, according to the Davids, Graeber and Wengro, the Yanumami are not statistically any more violent than any other American tribe. But because of a book called The Fierce People, their reputation was sealed. 
So how does this affect the battle between the sexes and whether Western civilization has made love and life both more peaceable? To Team David, the only way to really test that theory is by finding people who have experienced both and were able to make a free choice. Pinker quotes a white girl who was abducted by the Yanomami in 1932, and he gives her account of a violent raid that was conducted by them. Now, the Davids give more history and context to that woman, who was named Helena Valero and her family was from Brazil. She grew up with the Yanomami and married twice and achieved some status. But as an adult, she decided to find her kin and return to them in Brazil. She said that what she experienced was occasional hunger, but constant loneliness and dejection. And so she ended up returning to the Yanomami to live out the rest of her life. This is collaborated by accounts I'd read before by Benjamin Franklin, saying that when Indian children were raised by the colonists, the first time that they went on an Indian ramble, nothing could persuade them to come back. But when white children were abducted by the natives, that they, even when ransomed by their families and brought back, would take the first opportunity possible to escape into the woods. The David summarized that choice by saying that security takes many forms. There's the security of knowing you have a statistically smaller chance of dying at the end of an arrow. But then there's the security of knowing that there are people who will care deeply if you do. In 1609, a French missionary reported that he was having little success converting the Mi'kmaq because what they said to him was, you are always fighting and quarreling among yourselves. We live peaceably. You are envious and are all the time slandering each other. You are thieves and deceivers. You are covetous and are neither generous nor kind. As for us, if we had a morsel of bread, we share it with our neighbor. Later that century, the Jesuits wrote about the Wendat nation of modern day Canada. They felt that the sexual equality and freedom was particularly scandalous, and they were convinced that the women were all out to seduce them. But even more scandalous than that was that there was no obedience to authority. A child didn't need to obey their father, that a wife didn't need to obey her husband, and that even the chief could only compel people to do what they wished to do anyway. He could only use his powers of persuasion, but couldn't make them do anything. Even laws weren't something that the Wendat needed to obey, even though the Jesuits had to admit that their system of justice worked. What happened is that if there was a wrong done to someone, the entire clan would make amends and that people would add whatever they wanted in terms of a point of honor. So if someone had wealth, which was wampum or strings of beads, that they would add that as something that gave them social status. So therefore, the entire group kept their kin in line. And it was something that was a matter of pride and created bonds of both sympathy and understanding and forgiveness between different clans. But the most important difference between indigenous and Western civilizations for the purposes of this theme on sex and power is the concept of money. In my episode of The Story of Money, I go through David Graeber's research on how coinage ended up creating this self-perpetuating conquest machine in which everyone had to add to the material support of an army that was enslaving their neighbors or risk being enslaved themselves. And debts became something that could be paid off by selling your wife into servitude or your children or yourself as a last resort. The Wendat differentiated between money or wampum and wealth 
which I define in my book also as economic resources, that which allows you to be self-reliant. So they looked at land as something that was owned by women in families and worked by the women and then stored collectively and distributed through the women's collectives. So there was no way in which money or economic resources could be used in order to make someone work for you or to give you power to compel them to do anything. So men used wampum as political gifts to appease for a wrongdoing or as generosity towards a visitor, and women used it for gambling, of which they were quite fond. So to the outrage of the Jesuits, women were considered to have full control over their own bodies, and that therefore unmarried women had sexual liberty, and married women could divorce at will. The wicked liberty of the savages, one insisted, was the single greatest impediment to their submitting to the yoke of the law of God, or apparently submitting to the yoke of the law of men. Since presumably the Wendat have evolved from the same set of caveman monkey genes that we have, so while the statesmen for the Wendat may have desired a bevy of young fertile women, there was no way for him to compel that by withholding the means of sustenance. He could have possibly traded strings of wampum, but he would have really lost in status while they would have gained in gambling tokens. If nature can be eliminated as the reason that young women will mate with a man of status, then what about nurture? In our culture, a word that I am using very loosely, there's nothing that you can do to raise a child without money. Money is required for shelter, food, education, transportation, uh, clothing, entertainment, heat, light, everything that you need in order to live has to be gotten through money because there's no community that's going to support you while you're supporting your child. If we were involved to live this way, none of us would be alive today. What David Buss gets right and is self-evident is that reproduction is evolution. The two terms are synonymous, but it's a sorry statement for males if they haven't evolved beyond impregnating as their goal. The nurture of any next generation is the purpose of any species more evolved than squid, who I learned have the shot in the dark mating strategy of mating with anything with eight arms, including other male squid. As a society, we need to catch up to the evolutionary maturity of the 17th century Wendat and put the wealth as the means of economic resources back in the hands of women where they can pass it on through matriarchal lineage and make sure that self-reliance is preserved for generations to come. And maybe send men back to hunting and give them tokens with which they can play politics, but which can't compel them to make anyone do something that they don't want. And then we'll find out whether nature and evolution has created young women so that they want to mate with rich old geezers. If you want to delve deeper into how money works, or more importantly, doesn't work for us, here is the story of money on the second chapter of my book and David Graeber's research. And here is the three greatest conspiracies in plain sight, which also happens to talk about women taking power from their own sexuality. Thank you for being part of my community, and I so appreciate my subscribers on YouTube and Substack, where this shows up with links and text. Thank you.